Hi and welcome back to a new video. The 5800X 3D has been out for several weeks already. We didn't have a chance to get one in our hands for launch day, which is not really a problem because we can still produce some very nice and informative content, I think, around this CPU. Because also a few days ago, I read a news where somebody else was trying to undervolt the 5800X 3D heavily and this way make it even more efficient than it already is. And in today's video, we will try to get some FPS per watt numbers. Right next to me, I have a setup which is running a 12900K and a 3080Ti. And I already recorded some numbers with different gaming benchmarks, recorded FPS and also the power consumption at the same time. And now we will set up a different system with the 5800X 3D and then undervolt it and see how it will perform versus the 12900K when it comes to efficiency. At this point, I want to thank ASUS for providing this CPU. And I was quite fascinated when it arrived, the way it's packaged. Yeah, I mean, that, that's another way of protecting the pins. It's basically a socket without a mainboard. Very interesting. Besides testing the 5800X 3D, which is certainly going to be very interesting, also efficiency-wise, the power consumption of the CPU is fairly low. And then we have this thing right here. So that's uh, like a retro cooler. It's from a company which I'm not sure how you pronounce it. It could be Scythe, it could be Scythe, it could be Skyte. I heard all different variations over the years and I'm still not sure which way is the correct one. So if you know that, maybe let me know in the comments. But anyway, this is the, I would call it Scythe Orochi. And this is a monster. It's one of the biggest passive coolers they made in the previous years. I think this is already like 10 years old and I'm pretty sure that this thing can easily cool the 5800X 3D passively. But I'm wondering what kind of temperatures we will see. The only mounting brackets I still had left I think is socket 775 and 3066. It's at least not AMD but I just simply laser cut this out of acrylic like three millimeter thick acrylic used the stock screws put it on here. I'm pretty sure that should be an easy way to mount this on a recent AM4 motherboard. Out of the socket, back into the socket. That is one big boy. Mounting worked out fine. I could even use the stock screws from the AMD mounting, just replaced like this plastic part in between. Very curious what kind of temperatures we will see with this thing. Setup is completely assembled as you can see and also has been sitting in idle for almost one hour. But you can also see that clearly this is not like new. It has been sitting in a box for over 10 years, which you can also clearly see on like the oxide you can see on the copper. And I was wondering if there's like any like secret sauce you can use for cleaning heat pipes, make them look fresh, if you have any good idea. I know that there are several acids you can use for like etching a little bit on the copper or if there is any like a good solution you have, please let me know in the comments. I also know that vinegar helps once in a while or like the acid inside the vinegar is sometimes quite useful. Maybe I will try that later in this video. I kept hardware info open for about 45 minutes in the background. I did some basic stuff like installing some drivers and like games and stuff like that. So just like normal stuff you do on your PC. And I also have some stuff open in the background like Steam is running, Discord is running, the typical tools you would have running in the background. So I think this is a more realistic approach. And you can see over the previous like 47 minutes right now, we had an idle power draw of about 28 watt on the CPU, while peak was about 50. Peak temperature was almost 80 degrees Celsius. Right now in idle it's sitting at 60, which is certainly high for idle if you compare it with any kind of air cooler or like AIO cooler. It's certainly also in a region which is still completely fine, but it's definitely a bit more warm. Yeah, so Cinebench, not quite sure. Gaming would probably work. So let's just run R20 and see what kind of performance we can achieve. It's just the same idle condition as we still have. So we're under load. This CPU is right now consuming about 100 watt during the R20, but it's also decreasing a bit, which could be an indication that we already experience some sort of thermal throttling because it's also hitting 90 degrees Celsius, even though it does not indicate thermal throttling down there. About 5200 points, that is certainly below what you would typically achieve with a properly cooled 
5800X 3D, I guess we are missing about 10 to 12% in performance. But at the same time, this is not the CPU you would typically pick for render applications or even Cinebench because it's running a lower clock than the normal 5800X. But I think the strength is certainly gaming. That's why we should just move over to some gaming benchmark. And I'm kind of curious what kind of temperatures we will see running some games. Already spent quite some time in the game and this is working out so much better than I expected. The temperature is high, like 86, 87 degrees Celsius, but you can also see the boost at like 4.2, 4.3 gigahertz across most of the cores. So I'm pretty sure we're not lacking any kind of performance in gaming while the CPU is still 100% passively cooled. That is actually quite impressive. I'm now done with my gaming benchmarks. I also want to add that for doing the gaming benchmarks, I added a fan on the cooler simply because I do not want that the result is somehow screwed by like the cooling capacity maybe. That's why I added a fan for the basic testing. We're starting with some normal gaming benchmarks, Battlefield 2042, Far Cry 6 and PUBG. First look on Battlefield, in this benchmark the 5800X 3D is only somewhere in the center. That's mainly because we're sorting all of our benchmarks always going by minimum FPS. If we would sort by average FPS, the CPU would win with about 122 average FPS. It's also a thing that the 5800X 3D, even though AMD clearly calls this the fastest game CPU and Intel is claiming the 12900KS to be the fastest gaming CPU, I think there is no clear winner because in one game the one wins and in the other game the other one wins. But I'm pretty sure that there is one thing where the 5800X 3D always wins and that is efficiency. If we now look at FPS per watt, you can clearly see how much more efficient the 5800X 3D is compared to, for example, a 12900K or even a 5950X. Simply because it's still my favorite game, I'm also still testing PUBG, and this is a game where AMD CPUs generally do not perform so well. But we can clearly see a huge jump from the 5800X 3D over the normal 5800X. We have about 10% increase in minimum FPS and about 15% increase on average from like 375 FPS to 440. But again here if we look at FPS per watt, the 5800X 3D beats all of the Intel CPUs with about 6.3 FPS per watt. And of course also to cover the FPS limit or GPU limit topic, we also did a 4K benchmark, Far Cry 6. And as usual, you can see there's pretty much no change, doesn't matter if you're running a 12400, a 12600, or even a 12900K, or the 5800X 3D. They basically all behave and perform the same. And I saved the best for last, and that's Far Cry 6 in 1080p, because this game, for whatever reason, seems to perform extremely well with CPU performance. And here we can see the clear winner is the 5800X 3D. And I'm not quite sure why this is the case, but I tested everything like three times, and we have about 50% increase from the 5800X to the 5800X 3D. And I'm not quite sure why this is the case. To be fair, we only have a small increase in minimum performance, like minimum FPS, but looking at the average FPS, that is a quite insane result. And again, here the look at FPS per watt. Again, clear winner 5800X 3D with about 2.2 FPS per watt. It clearly beats the 12900K, but it also clearly beats almost doubles the efficiency over the 5950X. It also kind of indicates why the 5950X is not the perfect gaming CPU. Obviously, there are multiple ways to undervolt and underclock a CPU to make it a bit more efficient. I simply tested different frequencies and different voltages, and for me, 3.9 gigahertz at a very high offset of 0.225 volt turned out to be kind of the sweet spot. And now running R20 in Windows, you can see 3.9 gigahertz across all of the cores at 0.9 volt. So that's still a fairly high clock for a very low voltage and temperature wise, and this is 100% passively cooled we have about 62 degrees Celsius under render load and about 55 watt power consumption. And the result will give us 4200 points. And to put these number into perspective, a 9900K can achieve about 4400 or 4500 points in R20 while it consumes about 250 watt. So the 5800X 3D in our under voltage and underclocked case performs about 5% worse than a 9900K but only consumes a fifth of the power draw. 
and to visualize how cool this system really stays with the optimized settings with the undervolting, we will simply switch to the thermal imaging camera. And you can straight clearly see that the CPU cooling block is staying so much colder than our RTX 3080 Ti. I also want to point out though that the emission factor is optimized for aluminum right now and not for PCB temperature, that's why the area underneath the GPU could be like a false readout, but you can still see that it's staying rather cold. Like the air cooling fins have a temperature of about 45 degrees Celsius. Going back to Far Cry 6 1080p high, now with the 5800X 3D in the undervolted and underclocked state. And even though the CPU now pretty much appears at the bottom of the chart, you still have to pay attention to the power consumption at the same time when you look at the performance numbers. For example, compare it with the normal 5800X, which is just right above the 5800X 3D. It is only slightly faster at 2 FPS in minimum, while it consumes double the amount of power. And this also indicates that the normal 5800X is actually not a great CPU when it comes to the efficiency, at least in this benchmark. Even if you look at the 12900K, it consumes 84 watt in this case and has a higher performance than the normal 5800X. But the 5800X 3D, especially undervolted, is completely unbeatable when it comes to efficiency. Meanwhile, about one day later, and as you can see, I changed back to Intel. Simply because I was wondering what would happen if we would try the exact same thing like heavy undervolting and a bit of underclocking with Intel. How would this compare to AMD in terms of efficiency? As comparison, I decided to simulate a 12900 non-K simply because it will be very comparable with the 5800X 3D. Both are not overclockable CPUs and they are exactly in the same price range. I manually downclocked this 12900K to 4.2 on the P cores, 3 GHz on the E cores, and about 3.5 on the cache. Now if I run Cinebench R20, you can see that the voltage drops down to about 0 0.85, 0 0.84, which is pretty low. If we would want to go lower in voltage, you would have to significantly also lower the clock speed, which would then result in loss of performance. So I think this is pretty much the sweet spot. And during the gaming benchmark, as you can see, the power consumption is around 46 watt. That's not the actual benchmark run right now, but just to get an idea. I have to say I'm impressed and also surprised at the same time, because looking at the 12900, undervolted and underclocked, it pretty much is identical to the 5800X 3D. Going back to the chart, we can see 47 watt power consumption with the 12900. While it has a slightly higher power consumption, it also has slightly higher FPS on average, one FPS lower on minimum, but I think you could say they both behave exactly the same, at least as long as they are undervolted and underclocked. But what we learned from this experiment is also that whenever you pick the 5800X 3D and it reaches its working clock, it is much more efficient. Whereas if you look at all the lake, once it reaches its working frequency, like 5.1, 5.2 gigahertz, which is the frequency it requires to reach the high performance to compete with AMD, it has a higher power draw. So very interesting how these architectures behave completely different, even though both are seven nanometer CPUs. So I think that was quite interesting. Um, I think it's still quite difficult to say which CPU is the fastest in gaming overall because one CPU is the best at one benchmark and the other CPU is the best at the other benchmark. But I think we don't have to argue about that a 5800X 3D right now is the most efficient gaming CPU. Okay, I think it's, yeah. Time for me to play a little bit with Makita. So thanks for tuning in and see you next time. Bye bye.